everyone. Welcome back to Gordy's Gas Bags. Uh, we have got to the end of the week. It is a Friday. Uh, corona still in the background, hanging about and looking like coming close to me sometime this weekend. Um, well, I can't remember what episode I'm up to, so I'm just going to call it Episode Jesus. And look who's here. None other than Elizabeth <laughs> Ellis. Episode Jesus. Hello, Susan. How Hello. lovely to see your face. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> hey. Look at you dressed. And I actually got up this morning and put on my phone oh. here. <laughs> my Look at you and you, you know what? That is not what you wear on the farm. I love well, how people think you wear like check shirts on the farm. You wear this, high vis. High vis. Right, high vis and some denim shorts. Yeah, it's nice. And P.S. This is from Country Road, so I don't think it's appropriate <laughs> for the farm. <laughs> It wouldn't last five minutes on this farm. I've got to have high vis because I am seriously, I've, with all this coronavirus and all my work, I'm not working at the moment. I'm a farmhand. Yeah. That's what I do. Farmhand. How's Matthew coping with that? Not as well as many people <laughs> might think. <laughs> like, like, but like he's, well, uh, like I, yesterday I was shoveling like grain out of a bin and like throwing it to cows and today I was helping him change a tractor tire and I'm thinking I played 122 test matches and I have two university degrees and here I am. Yeah. I, Shovel it. You know what? Shoveling actually, grain. Yeah, shoveling. I was I thought you were going to say shoveling shit, but anyhow. Uh, no, I'm trying to dodge it. It's all down the driveway. Our driveway is a kilometre long and the kids, like Austin's just learned to ride and we've got Evelyn a new bike and they want to ride down the driveway and they come home and they've got cow shit in a line up their back because they're not quite good at dodging. I'm like, ah, oh, could you ride around it? Anyhow. Oh, dear. Hey, um, beautiful farm. Look at, look at the backdrop. It's beautiful, isn't it? This is actually the crap view. Um, there's like where I'm sitting, I've got, we've got this beautiful view up to the border, border ranges, but it's sort of a bit hard to see. So I thought I'd put you to this one, but it is, it's so lovely. I'll, mm -hmm. um, I'll just show you. We've got this gorgeous, um, bear with me while I walk around. So. Yep. Like this from our house. Can you see that dam yeah. down there? Yeah, it's lovely. just lovely. And I sort of, and that's, I don't know if you can see up there. Oh. That's the border ranges up there. And the, and the pool. pool. I'm looking at the pool. That's where my corona should be. Well, yeah, funny. I've been, um, well, I, I've been swimming um, a kilometre in the pool every couple of days. And uh, we've just built a cabana down the end. So on Fridays, I get out for cocktail time. Oh, <laughs> Fridays only, eh? Yeah, that's all I'm telling you. Yeah, well, you did tell me the other day that you had to put a bit of discipline on yourself. I did, you know, like, because normally when I'm, like, when I'm home, I'm only home three or four nights a week, so I'll have a glass of wine with Matthew. And then, because um, I'm home all the time now, we're like, oh, my God, it's party night every night, and we've got a cellar. So you just toddle down to the cellar, and we've built this great cabana, and there's a hammock. So anyway, I thought, right, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, alcohol-free days, and it's sort of given us a bit of structure to our week, so... <laughs> It's yeah. a structure to the week by just removing alcohol for three days. I know. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? Crazy. Crazy. Oh my God. Hey, so I was going to, I've actually asked you this question since you've gone into isolation. So you, you, we've all lost a lot of work, Lizzie, pretty much all of it. You're, mm -hmm. you're near Byron Bayway. Um, so you can't cross the border into Queensland, couldn't get a flight, couldn't do anything, just in complete lockdown. Just in complete lockdown. So there are flights just starting now out of Lismore and Ballina. Yep, Lismore is the closest, one of the yep. big closest towns, which is how much I love myself. I moved to a place called Lismore. <laughs> Boom, dish. Here all week. Try the steak. My husband grew it. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, but also like uh, Channel 9 really early on said, look, all non-essential travel can. So that meant that I couldn't travel. So I've done a few things online for them for Sports Sunday. So... Um, the danger, of course, as Coxie pointed out on air on the show the other day, is that when I only work for three minutes a week, it tends to be a little bit nuts. <laughs> when I do get to work, I'm a bit overexcited and, oh, my God. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I haven't been able to work. Like so many people, like the, the bottom dropped out of everything that I have booked. So, you know, it's um, on the one hand, I could think, really worry about that because, um, you know, farming doesn't quite pay a huge amount of money but on the other hand I've actually I'm an optimist at heart right so I've just decided to um just to really enjoy the time with the kids and get stuck into some gardening and my veggie garden looks the best it's ever looked so 
you know, the, I've got heaps of vegetables growing and it's starting to produce some beautiful stuff. So there's an upside to it. And whilst the downside is that um, at some point soon or some point in the future, we're going to have to have a bit of a financial reckoning. Um, I've sort of put that out of my head. That's down the track. And at the moment, I'm just really enjoying being home. How could you not love being here? Yeah, and what a beautiful day it looks like in the background, which always helps the mood, doesn't it, particularly? Yeah, it, it does. And right. like it's been like this, you know, we got some great rain in February that we got affected. We weren't as drought stricken as other parts of Australia and New South Wales, but we certainly were affected by the drought at the end of last year. We had to offload stock. You know, it affects your mood when there's no rain and everything's brown and like it's such doom and gloom and then we got some great rain in febs and you can see behind me how um it doesn't look as green as it probably should because all the grass has gone to seed so now you're seeing their beautiful golden heads so um you know like we're in a really fortunate situation and so it just means that every day i get up and i say oh, I've got another day in paradise um to play with the kids lizzie uh your um, your story is probably quite well known by people so we're going to try and find some bits and pieces that maybe people don't know but i'll keep on the farm for the moment so you're you're a city kid you mm -hmm. and matthew what uh, well to a degree matthew has a background of being a country kid yeah sorry i do yeah. understand that but at what point did that discussion come between the two of you it was time to do what do this and build where you are and what, what happened um yeah well matthew and i God, we realised the other day we've been together for 27 years. Ha! But because I'm away so often, it feels like three months, right? So that's, yes. that's, that's <laughs> is the, the key to the happy marriage is spend half your time away. Um, but when I met him, he had been in Sydney for a couple of years playing football, but he always had it in his mind that farming was in his blood. So when he was a kid, his parents were dairy farmers mm. um, at Bathurst and then they turned their hand, they moved to Coffs Harbour and, and had a banana farm. And then they came back to Bathurst and did beef and crops and that sort of stuff. So when I met him, he was still going up to Bathurst, you know, every month or for a weekend or whenever he could to work with his dad on the farm. And he and his brother owned um, a farm. So uh, that was always something that was talked about. But um, we sort of were never sure whether we'd go back to Bathurst to live or whether we just have some acreage and live in Sydney but it was always something that was in the background and then um, my sister moved up to uh, northern New South Wales about 15 years ago and maybe not quite that long ago. anyway so let's say 15 years ago and uh, we were coming up and visiting her and we started to think gosh this is beautiful up here and then it was just sort of everything lined up so we had started to visit her we we're thinking it was beautiful then Matthew had a business in Sydney um, and he and his partners sold that business and did quite well out of it. It's just before the GFC, so timing is everything. I'd retired from netball and I was working for Channel 10 at the time. So I could I can do my job from anywhere, right? Because most weekends I start and finish at an airport. Mm. Um, it, it adds a little bit of complication being in the country, but you can still do it. So we just thought, why don't we look for a farm? So we came up here, we sort of had a really good idea of what we wanted. We wanted um, more than a hundred acres. We didn't want um, macadamia nuts because we didn't want to do cropping. We wanted to run livestock or Matthew wanted to run livestock. Um, and we eventually, after about six months of searching, found this place. It didn't have a house on it, which meant that we could build our house, but it had nothing on it. So we had to put in the electricity and the, you know, your septic system and the driveway costs a fortune, right? So <laughs> we've learned, I mean, I'm learning every day about farming. I know far more about beef cattle than I ever thought I would. But, you know, Matthew's had to teach himself to weld and we bought an excavator. And so we sort of built it from the ground up. And it's been the best thing we ever did. So when we moved up here, we kept an apartment in Sydney because we thought, oh, if we hate it, yeah. we can always go back to Sydney. And then about uh, five years ago, we sold it because we just thought, we don't need it. We're never going back to the city to live. And it was so funny when we first moved up here, you know, Coxie and uh, Megan Anderson and all my mates in Sydney, Brian, they all thought they needed to come and have an intervention to rescue me from the country. <laughs> and they were like, I can't believe you're living here. I remember Selena Gilson came and stayed once and she was like, it's so quiet. I'm like, yeah, dude, it's the country. So, it's a nice balance yeah, though, isn't it though? Because you live a lie, you live the, the limelight outside of, of that. So it, do you find that's your great balance to be able to be the public face and the travel and everything and to be able to come back and just breathe the fresh air? 
Yeah, totally. And, you know, sometimes if I get caught at an airport or my flight's delayed, I think my life would be so much easier if I lived in Sydney or Melbourne. But then I get home and I look up at the mountains and I've got this huge veggie patch I'll take you up and show you there later. It's beautiful and I get my hands dirty and I go out with Matthew and at the moment we've got cows that are calving, right? So, you know, we've got um, a heap of breeders and we supply to a butcher in town and even after, we've been here nearly 10 years and I still get excited when you just see a little calf born and mm. it get, its mother licks it and it gets up on its little wobbly legs. Like it still, it thrills me. So sort of to see that, it, it grounds me. I come home, like you say, I'm not wearing any jewellery. I put a bit of lippy on for you today, Gordy. <laughs> you shouldn't have. <laughs> but you, know, you shouldn't have. <laughs> I know I shouldn't. You can't really see, can you? No. Um, like no. I don't, I take all my jewellery off. I don't wear makeup. I don't do my hair. I wash my hair especially for you. But as you can see, I don't even say I'm really grey because I can't be going to the hairdressers at the moment. Um, so, like, it, it grounds me. It's just, it makes me feel so happy to be here. And for us to be able to, for my kids, right, they see, they see the full food production, right? So that we bring up cows and then we have to wean them off their mothers and you send them off um, to the casino to the local abattoir and they end up in the butchers and they come some of it comes back on our plate most of it gets sold through the butchers but they understand that so they're respectful um we don't waste meat we eat smaller portions of meat because you know what the cows have to mm. what happens mm. you know we have we have pig a couple of pigs every year that we use for the christmas ham um their names are invariably christmas and lunch but um <laughs> although last year they were it was spider pig and something else um uh, cladded with a chance of meatballs that's right so but like <laughs> the kids are, like they see they they yeah. we bring these pigs up and then we send them off and they see what happens so they're so respectful and they know that their vegetables come largely from the veggie patch and it's a really beautiful way of life you know and um, th but th there's a little bit of that stem because part of your story was that uh your parents grabbed you and cat your sister and took you around australia when you were young and you said that was yeah, one yeah. of the greatest 12 months of your life as a kid, learning and... Totally, right? So they took us out of school. Um, you know, uh, mum and dad both left their jobs. We had a caravan. I, in year four, I missed all of year four and my sister missed all of year two. It's funny, you know, it's been really interesting listening to people talk about this period of time where yeah. kids are home and they're missing school. Now, high school is a totally different thing, right? I don't want to talk about that, but... My kid, my little girl's in primary school. She's in year three. And I was in year four when my parents took me out of school for the year. We had one workbook, one exercise book, and our car broke down for two weeks in Noosa. Ha! Back when Noosa was this tiny little fishing village and or little holiday village. And on rainy days, Kath and I got all the way through our notebooks. And by the time we'd finished at Noosa or a month into our holiday, we'd done all our notebooks and we didn't have to do any more schoolwork for the yeah. rest of the year, right? So... And the upshot is, like, I've got two university degrees. My sister has uh, a university degree. She's got a master's. She's just enrolled to do further education at Harvard, right? So it hasn't affected our long-term education because we're spending the time with our parents. We were following our curiosity. Um, and we learnt just so much about life from that period of time. And so, yeah, we spent a lot of time in the bush and the outback and mum and dad loved it, dad in particular. So. You know, when my dad died just after the 2007 World Cup, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. And in that last year of his life, we spent a lot of time talking about that time together as a family. And, you know, I think, and that's why I've been so relaxed about, um, like, the Evelyn schoolwork and this period of time, because it's an enforced period of time with your family that you might never get back again. So, um, and, and I have, I, I lived it for a year when I was in year four, and um, I have a totally different outlook on the world than I think I otherwise might have had. Embrace it or lose it, Lizzie, I say at the moment. So, yep. hey, listen, uh, you and Kath, great mates. Very funny, your sister. Sometimes I think she's funnier than you. I often think she's funnier <laughs> than me. And I sometimes steal her jokes. Yeah, and you sometimes <laughs> feed her rocks. Yeah. <laughs> so when we were little, like I was 22 months older than her, right, and I was a rubbish big sister. So um, one, one time mum was hanging some clothes on the line. And that was back in the days where you'd leave your kids in the in bassinet. It's like this was in the 70s, right? You wouldn't do it now, leave, leave one kid outside who's three months old and your two-year-old kid outside keeping an eye on her while you're ducking to get the washing and bring it out. By the time mum 
had brought the washing out, uh, cat's mouth full of rocks. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? She's like three months old. I'm like, she's hungry. <laughs> I was very right. <laughs> oh, and you know what? It's been pretty much that's pretty much the state of our relationship. She's like, we're so close. She's living in Hong Kong at the moment, so I miss her and her kids desperately. Uh, but yeah, she does make me laugh. But um, we've always had that underlying sibling sort of rivalry. Yeah. So a lot of people, some people will know of your, um, I guess, your birth into netball as such, and some people wouldn't. So I think we need to go there just for the moment. Um, and there might be a few Sheilas out there, good name, <laughs> that, that are watching <laughs> this. It was, a, it was an interesting moment when you started netball. Yeah, well, it was like, you know, sliding doors moment, right? Who knows what my life could have been like, like if it wasn't for a woman called Sheila Ether, um, the late Sheila Ether. So uh, my mum played netball at Windsor and, uh, you know, I hit sort of the eight-year-old mark and Sheila rang mum and said, oh, Marg, I'm putting together a team for Green Hills Netball Club. Does Liz want to play? And mum said, no, no, she's not very coordinated. <laughs> She's a bit of a bookworm. I don't think team sports would be for her, right? So, and I, you know, I tell this story often because I think it shows what, um, how netball women are such leaders and are such, are so good in the community, right? So Sheila was a mum of five kids. She ran a netball club. You wouldn't have said, oh, she's a great leader in the community. She wasn't the mayor or anything like that, but she was a massively important woman to so the lives of so many kids and she was a real leader in that regard. And I think netball needs to start to beat its chest about the role that these women play. So Sheila rang my mum back a week later. She goes, oh, Margaret, you won't believe what I've just read. Did you know that 90% of kids who end up as juvenile delinquents have never played team sport, <laughs> right? So, and in that intervening week, I had lit, like dug all the wax out of this little candle I had and stuck it on my bed and lit the wick and poured every match from the matchbox into the candle. <laughs> that is complication on my bed. Oh my God. So I was in so much trouble. So mum and dad are thinking that I'm going to be like a pyromaniac juvenile delinquent. So Sheila just nailed it. She not, like, I don't know if she knew that I'd tried to set the house on fire. But anyway, mum said, right, so, okay, well, Liz can start playing netball on the proviso that she finishes if she, if she can pull out whenever she wants because I don't think she'll like it. So I often laugh with mum that it took me 27 years to decide to pull out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And it wasn't because I didn't like it. It's because I was broken. Yeah. So what an amazing sort of woman to just go, no, nah, I'm not taking no for an answer. And this is what netball women are like, netball leaders are like, right? You don't, you don't fold at the first sign of bit of resistance. You actually go, I'm going to find a different way to get what I want. And, you know, I've got to say, I've been sort of thinking about this for a while. I've, you know, I do lots of work. I don't just do media work. I do lots of work in other sports and, sit on panels and work with them to, you know, to figure out, you know, what the way forward is. And I am consistently reminded of the fact that netball is in such a unique position because women are leaders in the sport. And in so many other sports, women have to struggle so much to, to either become a head coach or get on the board or be the CEO. Whereas I always assume that women could do that because my sport has shown me that women can do that. So I think we need to celebrate the fact that actually netball is a sport. It's the only sport that's run by and large by women um, for by and large women. Now that's changing. There's men's netball blokes are getting more and more involved, which is absolutely welcome. But I think we need to celebrate that fact that our sport is actually a great crucible to have women turn into leaders. And, yeah. you know, I saw that from a really early age when Sheila wouldn't take no for an answer. Imagine if she had taken no for an answer. I'd be, you know, a solicitor sitting in an God office somewhere us. i wouldn't have <laughs> God help us. uh i'd be on the high court gordy let's face it yeah and i'd probably be right in front of you <laughs> yeah Facing can you imagine <laughs> imagine you taking your drunk and disorderly charge all the way to the high court it's like i haven't even opened that bottle the whole however many episodes 17 episodes i'm doing quite well hey um do you You say that's the same bottle? No one believes you. No, I know. Hey, do you feel do you feel a weight on your shoulders at times 
being the face of netball or being the spokesperson of netball or being the, um, I guess, the activist at times for netball? Yeah, I think I do. And I feel the weight because it gets put there often. You know, something happens and um, it's not just netball, it's women's sport, right? So anytime there's an issue in women's sport, if it blows up at six o'clock, my phone starts ringing and uh, it's radio stations want to do interviews. Or have you heard what someone said or what someone did? And when you're trying to, like when I'm at home, I try to cocoon myself with the kids and with Matthew. And it's hard to sort of juggle that to go, oh, well, some sort of comment is needed. Some sort of leadership here is needed. But I just want to be a mum and lie in bed with my kids and have a cup of tea. So there's sort of that aspect. There is the weight that, and I often do forget this, that everything that comes out of your mouth gets analysed and can be twisted and can be presented as a different thing or different people have different interpretations. So, you know, I learned very early on that I just have to speak my truth. I can't worry about what other people think because then you, you start second guessing yourself and you don't say what you mean. So I do try to be as plain speaking as I can. And sometimes that gets me into trouble. Sometimes people don't like what they hear, but you know, I've got this great quote. that's always in the back of my head, which is a good girls never made history. And I think, you know, if I look at where women's sport is being nice to people, mm-hmm. isn't going to help us, right? You need to actually rattle the cage and speak your truth and upset the apple cart a bit to get to where you want. And, you know, I, I love where netball's got to, you know, we used to always think we had to be so nice and so prim and so proper and never make waves and that sort of stuff. Whereas absolutely make waves, be controversial. And I like now that, um, like, I don't know that I'm the face of netball. I think there's now lots of, lots of people who are out there, you know, there's Coxie, there's Laura, there's you making a name. For, like there's all these women out there making names for themselves with different opinions. And I reckon it's great because the more people you have, the better. And, you know, through my netball career, I used to run um, coaching clinics. And one of the things that I loved about them was to be able to create some income for my, my teammates and my friends. And I still feel like we're all still doing that at the moment. We're out there punching on. So I do feel sometimes like there's a weight and sometimes I think I can't, <laughs> just can't do it. I can't be bothered. But then I think, um, you know, you just, we're standing on the shoulders of giants you know, there's so many women who've gone before us. We're standing on their shoulders. We've got to have strong shoulders to hold the next generation who will step up and do it as well. Did you expect this interview between you and I to be so serious? <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm expecting like for this alien to unzip out of your oh, face no, and go, it's really, it's gaudy. We don't oh. really sit and have this kind of, com- like, we, you know, we, we're always work, work, or, you know, we're having a laugh about something, but we don't often really sit and talk like this, do we? No, and it would be weird if you and I were sitting at a bar and you go, Liz, yes. just the weight <laughs> sit on your shoulders. I'd be like, just get me another beer. You have a <laughs> Corona and I'll have a pale ale and we'll all be happy. Hey, um, not you- uh, just. But drink responsibly, of course. Yes, of course, of course. Hey, mm. do you, um, P.S., by the way, you've been thrown under the bus in about 14 of the previous 16 episodes <laughs> of this, so don't, don't start to act more <laughs> than you're now, I can tell you. <laughs> Bastards. Yes, that's right. Hey, do you, um, do you get when, mm, 122 tests, you're the most capped netballer in history in Australia. Do you get nervous someone might surpass you? I expect someone to surpass me. I expected Sherelle and then the sniper got her on the grassy knoll and took out her Achilles. Yep. Um, I have been assuming that, that Seabass will go past me. I mean, that's going to hurt my heart. There a goal shooter goes past me. Oh. Um, but, uh, you know, she debuted against me, um, I think. It was either her or Caitlin Thwaites. One of them debuted against me. But I played, I played against um, Seabass when she was in her first year. So it's sort of a nice baton to pass on. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether she makes it. I think this whole coronavirus thing is going to throw our sport, like every sport, for a curveball. So who knows if she's going to be able to rack up some international caps this year. I think the timing is going to start to get to her. Um, but, you know, it'll be really interesting. You know, you have your record and you expect for someone to break it and um, and it, it will happen and I'll be as gracious as I possibly can, even if it is a goal shooter. <laughs> But, you know, I do laugh, you know, of the four players who, five players who have played over 100 test matches, there's Vicky, 
Coxie, Shiraz, Shirazel, Seabass and me, I think it's saying that like the mid-court, you just run too much. You can't play 120-something tests. And then playing goal shooter is easy because there's three of them. Yeah, <laughs> that's a really good way to break it down. Mm. Oh, mate. Every, everything that I think of is like a fight between goal shooters and goalkeepers. I, I know. The goalkeeper club, you bring it up in commentary all the time. All the time. And one day I might just institutionalise it and make it a thing. Yeah, make it a thing. Uh, so in your 122 caps, let's go back to the first few. Oh, God. Okay. I remember young. the first one. You were young. Oh, such and a kid. Raw and green. And do you know what? On Facebook the other day, uh, Shelly O'Donnell dropped a, a... You need to go and have a look at this. Go and look up Shelly O'Donnell's Facebook um, feeds and she dropped a, a magazine photo of... uh, yeah i've got that you know what? i took a photo of it the other day in my scrapbooks and i've been meaning to post it and i saw shelly post it i thought i'll i'll put it on insta or something it's funny as oh my god jenny borlays michelle dendeck it, it's in it's crazy it that, is we're on the velvet i remember carissa hated that whole shoot because we weren't allowed to smile because yeah. it was all very gothic we we're all in velvet and we all had yeah. to look like sultry and I mean, I wouldn't know sultry. The only sultry I get is like December. Yeah. That's exactly. <laughs> about it when it's humid. And I'm, like, I remember that they parted our hair in the middle and, and, you know, like women, like girls like Carissa, who she was beautiful and she was really careful about her hair and stuff. She hated the whole thing, but still came up stunning. And the rest of us just stood in the background and pulled funny faces. <laughs> um, did you have the confidence that we see in Liz Ellis today? Did you have that? in the early days of the Australian side or were you just a little bit overawed by those around you? Bit of both. I've always had plenty of confidence. That's never been an issue. But um, I was a bit overawed and I think I used to piss them off, to be perfectly honest, because I was ah, 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 jumping around all bloody too much to say all the time. So, you know, there were, um, occasionally I got slapped down. Simone McInnes used to slap me down a bit, which will surprise nobody. Um, <laughs> She's, I mean, let's face it, she slapped all of us down at one point yeah. or another. Um, so, so occasionally, like, I'd come up against them and they'd give me a little clip around the ear like you'd expect of the big bulldog to give to the little puppy. And, um, but, you know, I always had the confidence, but um, it took me a long while to feel like I really belonged. Like, you know, you come into, I came into the team in 1993. It was two years after that 1991 game and every player that I looked at was a hero right and here I am so you never really feel like you belong and it took me a long time to get to that point so I had the confidence but that sense of I should be here it took that took a lot longer to come of all of the teammates throughout your Australian career who did you admire most oh that's a really tough one Oh, you could have at least given me a bit of a heads up that you're going to ask this question. Well, I, I hate to miss say who that someone. Love, I mean, because we know you and Coxie are, are, are best mates. So it was more, and I'm sure you admired her, but was there someone that stood out? Might have been Kath, I don't know. Uh, you know, there's pl there's players who, like, um, like you spoke to Sharon Finnan, right? I, I absolutely admire her because, you know, she was in the lead up to that 99 World Cup, she was in and she was out and, she was sort of there and thereabouts and on the fringes. And I remember just at the selection camp for that team, she just said to me, right, when I get put with you, we are going to dominate. And the steam coming out of her ears was amazing. And I always felt like really protected when I played behind her, you know, and oh God, there's so many players I admire. I always like players. I always admire players who got the absolute most out of everything that they had, you know, like a Bryony Akel was never, considered a superstar no one ever talked about her in terms of um australian selection but in our swifts team she was the heart and soul because she worked so hard to get to the point like to be the best club player that she could be you know and then to be able to play behind someone like kath harvey williams who was so ruthless and so uncompromising on court again you felt really protected behind her um and when i first made the australian team i was in absolute awe of Keely Devery. I loved her. I looked up to her. Not only was she a great player, she was funny. Um, she was good value. You know, she was a really great team person and she was the vice captain of that New South Wales team that I was in. So, um, you know, to be, to be a teammate of hers was just such a thrill and such an honour. And 
the fact that she's now our boss is just amazing. You know, we're still, you know, at the end of the season or after a game, if we go back to the bar for a drink, I'm still that little kid going, hey, Keely, <laughs> can, can I get you a gin? Can I get, can I get you something, Keely? Can I get, because it's so, it's still so exciting for me. You know, like, I, I laugh, you know, I'm the most capped player in Australian netball history, but at the end of the day, I'm still that 18 year old who's sitting there going, <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe so, I'm here? So of all the, of all that you've played in that same era of 122 games, you've had some uh, unbelievable opponents, and I'm not just talking directly, but across the court. So who 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 did you admire most of your opposition? No, oh, you, you can't go past Irene Van Dyke, right? And what I loved about, I mean, when I think about her. She made me the player I became, right? Because we first played each, against each other in 1995 and we finished playing up when I retired in 2007. And I would not have been the player I was if it wasn't for her. Because I used to wake up at, you know, I, I remember working, I was a solicitor and I used to wake up at five o'clock, get dressed, go to the gym, walk out, look at the stars, think, what am I doing? And then think, I bet Irene's up at the gym. So, you know, I worked to become, I knew that I had to be at the absolute top of my game just to compete with her. And then when I retired, I loved just watching her as her career went on, how she reinvented herself. You know, players can burst onto the scene and be great. You say, and it happens all the time. Someone has a great year and people go, oh, she's going to be a legend. No, no, no. To have that sort of status, you actually have to be able to reinvent your game year on year on year and, and change it up as you go. So... Um, you know, for her, I look at her and I think the game that she played in 1995 was so different to the game that she was playing, you know, in 2010 in that Commonwealth Games grand final, that it was almost unrecognisable. To me, that is just the sign of a great athlete. Mm. Um, so I loved watching her play. Um, oh, gosh, all down the court, there was great plays. I used to, um, there was a little uh, Jamaican mid-quarter, Nadine Bryant, who was, mm. um, I got to Ooh. play in the same team as her, we had it. There was a World 17 one year um, and we played in New Zealand. And I made some great friends in that team. You know, um, Helen Lonsdale, her and I are still great mates, English mid quarter. We roomed together. And what was funny about that team was um, <laughs> how many. So uh, Harbs was the captain and I was just, you know, the goalkeeper. But so many of the girls in that team came in and were terrified of. Of Harbs and I, um, because like they thought what we were like on court was what we were like off court, and I'm I was an asshole on court, but I'm not that bad off court. I'm yeah. much funnier, right? Yeah. So and so I mean the first game we had, the very first game, Elaine Davis was a Jamaican goal shooter, right? So we all have this. Uh, Jill McIntosh was a coach. She gives us our game plan. Harbs gives us a bit of a pump up, and then Elaine. Um, wanted to pray she was quite devout and she goes dear lord we'd be thanking god that Catherine and Liz aren't the ogres we thought they'd be <laughs> I'm like, oh well the bar's pretty low I'm not an ogre that's good oh, so yeah but in that team was Nadine Bryant right and she was a great mid quarter she was so fast and so, and so assuming and so Jamaican you know get under your body and make it difficult but off court she was this beautiful soft gorgeous woman so you know I loved watching her play I remember playing against um Laura Langman when she was 16 we had a tour in New Zealand and you play club teams in the lead up and someone pointed her out and said she's going to play for New Zealand and she was very raw but very good still had the long socks on so not much has changed for yeah. her yeah um and oh god there's been so many great players that you think I can't believe I got to play against them and then to see some players now um, who they debuted when, you, when I was towards the end of my career. You know, I look at Kim Green and she was this young kid who came in, used to wear a school uniform to training and she used to turn up and she was so um, brash in the way she played and so yeah. confident in the way she played. And, you know, she's evolved into a really great leader um, now on and off the court. So I was so lucky to play against, you know, to, just to, to play against Irene Van Dyke and be mentioned in the same breath as her, who she's such a magnificent athlete, it's unbelievable. But then, you know, to see some of the great goal attacks, you know, Belinda Colling, really great ball mover. Um, Connie Francis, you know, she was a great ball mover. She was pretty good on the sledge. She always had plenty to say when you were <laughs> just playing, running that goal attack position, you know. Um, oh, God, so many really 
great mid quarters that I've seen. And then, you know, down, um, down the defense end of the court, you know, Benice many was just extraordinary. I'd watch her and she'd be taking intercepts and I'm like, why can't I play a zone? I want to play a zone like she is. And she's <laughs> flying out and getting all these intercepts. She was terrific. Um, you know, Oberon Peterson from Jamaica was an awesome, really intimidating goal defender. Um, so there's just been so many great players who you think, I think I've been able to sit on the court and watch them do their business. Yeah, it, it, you've listed, and, and your list of names then just goes to show your 122 years. Isn't it? <laughs> 122 years, your 122 caps, my apologies. Um, That's all right. It probably felt like 122 years, I imagine. Hey, so I, you've talked about teammates and you've talked about opposition. Let's go to your chickens. I mean, your, your coaches. <laughs> So when we first moved to the farm, we got chooks, right? And I was trying to figure out what to name them. And I was like, I love my chooks. I could sit and watch them all day. They are fascinating creatures. I mean, pecking order, the phrase yeah. pecking order comes from the chickens, right? Because they very, like we got them and then they just spent the first couple of weeks establishing who was the top of the pecking order, right? So I watched them carefully and I thought, I'm going to name these chickens after my coaches. So I had Sheila, my first coach, Helen, my first rep coach, uh, Julie, after Julie Fitzgerald, Jill, Joyce, yeah. Norma had six chooks, right? So I had them all named. Sadly, Sheila grew into a rooster, right? So oh. Sheila was a boy. So Sheila lost her head, sadly. Oh. Um, and then after a while, I mean, it was just the funniest thing to watch them and go, oh my God, that's just what Julie Fitzgerald would do. Oh, that's Norma. <laughs> that's, oh yeah, that's definitely like Joyce was a bit aloof and, but a bit good. So she would always find the best stuff, but never tell any, like, she was just like really aloof and good. Never wanted to be like her and Norma would be in there and Jill would be looking around and like, it was just, I just, they were the, anyway, but one day they all pecked Norma to death. So, um, you know, I haven't ever told Norma that. But now she'll probably find out. <laughs> so if we're talking about coaches and there's been a bit of a, I guess, not a theme, but there's been a few discussions through the previous episodes of this around um, the next or the incoming Australian coach. Um, I think you're fairly well platformed to have an opinion here. <laughs> Even if I wasn't, I'd still have an opinion, let's face it. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm setting that Thanks. up. I was like, I know. Why would Please you bother? Us? Now, who do you think? Well, look, I think that Simone McInnes is probably um, the front runner. She would be who I would um, probably choose. But it's interesting, isn't it, right? So lots of people are talking about Bryony Akel. And I think Bryony will eventually make a great Diamonds coach because she is a real players coach. But you know, I've spoken to her at length about this and she spoke to you. She, it doesn't, it's not, it's not for her at the moment. She's got little kids. Um, she also feels like she's still learning her craft. So we can put her aside for a moment. I'd love, I think, to have the next Diamonds coach as someone who has played a significant period of time in the dress. That leaves Simone, someone like Vicky Wilson, who I know, Vicky's coach Fiji. So she's certainly credentialed to coach at that international level. Um, I think. Simone probably has the edge at the moment because she's had that cut and thrust. And I think, you know, I'm on record to saying this is no surprise that I think Lisa Alexander, whilst a great coach, was probably outcoached on the game day stuff um, in recent years by Nolene Tarua. And I just think being in that cut and thrust week in, week out, where your decisions every five minutes absolutely matter and you get used to living or dying by those are so important. And Simone's the one that's had that. So I think We've probably got to look to our National League coaches, current coaches, um, uh, and look to see who is probably the best placed. And I think that Simone McInnes is probably the best placed. Having said that, I'd love to see a real collegiate approach taken. So if Simone was the head coach, um, to be able to uh, look to other coaches for example Julie Fitzgerald has so much experience and so much to offer she came within a whisker of picking up the New Zealand job mm. a couple of years ago you know she's such a fine coach Bryony you know Stacey Marinkovic has done a great job um, obviously Rose there's coaches all over the shop I think we're really blessed with some great coaches at that at that super, super netball level but um, you know if you're gonna and I, I know that there's this argument that um, you can't have a head coach of one team coaching the Diamonds. Whereas I think, I think Simone 
um, has bled green and gold for that diamond stretch. She's not, she's not the sort of personality that's going to let her club loyalties override her national loyalties, you know, and I think there's ways around that. You can have, you can build a structure around it and people are professional enough that we can all live with that structure and you can have, you know, advisors and assistant coaches and that sort of stuff and really bring everyone into the tent to make sure that you get the, the right thing for the diamond. So I guess that's a long way of saying I think Simone McKinnis should be the next Diamonds coach. Yeah, no, and I was just going to say to that point that you've just made, there, I don't think there would be a current national uh, Suncorp Super Netball coach that wouldn't fit under what you've just said. I think they could all manage in one way or another a dual role, providing, as you say, the structure around it supported. And you would like to yeah, think the other Suncorp Super Netball coaches, if one of them got in, would also support that. Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, we saw, you know, speaking to um, to people like Nolan and, and people within New Zealand to see how she did it, you know, she coached the Silver Ferns from another country mm. to a World Cup. So she didn't do it all by herself. Mm. She brought in coaches from all their different franchises, gave them really specific tasks and everyone bought into it. So you need a coach who can create that. Mm. Um, you need a coach who's got, you know, the ability to create that, has got the respect of the players, really understands what it means to be in that diamonds environment and to wear that dress, um, who's got the coaching credentials, but has also been in that cut and thrust week in, week out. And as long as you're transparent, right? If you, the players are smart, you know, if, you, if the coach is coming in, is transparent about everything that's, that's been doing and is a good communicator, the players will, will be fine because they're smart. They understand stuff and they just want to be told the truth. The... Coach gets appointed and your mobile phone rings and they <laughs> say, uh, I understand, Liz, that, you know, you have a, a massive role in the media and everything else that you do, but I need you to have some involvement with the Australian Diamonds, be it in a specialist role, I want you as a, an assistant in some capacity, et cetera, et cetera. Are you open to that? No. And I'll tell you why. Um, I would love to be involved in the future, but in this regard, I'm a bit like Brian Haykel uh, in that my family is my first priority. I've got an eight-year-old girl and a four-year-old boy, and they're only going to be this age once. So I'm really careful about the work that I do. You know, I pick and choose. I've got my contract with Channel 9. Um, I do heaps of keynote speaking and that sort of stuff, um, but I only do one a week. So I'm not away for any longer. I couldn't accept a role where I would have to be available away from home any more than I currently am. And it just wouldn't work. And I would, it would be grossly unfair for me to say, yep, I'd love to be involved. I've got so much experience and knowledge and then go and only do it half assed right? Yeah. You can't do anything with the diamonds half pace. You've actually got to be 100% in or get out of the way and somebody who is 100% in can come in. So when my kids are older, it's the sort of thing that, I would love to be involved in like mm. being in that diamonds environment is the be all and the end all right you are dealing with excellence and athletes who want to be excellent and who are continually trying to improve so I couldn't do that if I I would feel like I was cheating them if I wasn't a hundred percent in so you know I mean you've you've seen it I won't take calls after a certain time at night when we're doing stuff you know with channel nine I'm really careful about how I do that because being with my kids and my family is number one priority and then everything else has to fit around that. So, um, no, I wouldn't. And I just don't think that it would be fair to A, my family, but B, to the athletes. You have to be 100% in or, or stay away. And I appreciate it's taken us two weeks to get to this point, Liz. <laughs> See? Keep saying to you, nah, can't do it. <laughs> School holidays now, so it's okay. The kids, are, oh, they've all gone to get a haircut or something with their father. But, um, yeah, like, I don't know. I just think, yeah, and um, oh, it's well documented. We, oh, we had all sorts of tr problems falling pregnant with Austin. We went through four years of fertility treatment. I don't want to miss out on a second with my kids mm -hmm. because they are the most important people in the world to me. And... You know, my parents had a really good example that your family comes first and everyone else can fit in. And I'm in a really, I'm in a luxurious situation. I chose to have my kids later in life. So financially I can, I can afford to say no to things. And if, 
if that upsets or puts people's noses out of joint, that's totally okay because it's not my problem. My whole priority is, is my family. Yeah, love it. Absolutely love it. Um, how much do you love commentary? Love it. Love it. I've, and it's, it's, it's been a craft that I've had to learn. I've had to learn to shut up, <laughs> as you would know. <laughs> hey, have you seen wow. that? Have you seen that? Um, I think Channel 9 or Suncorp have put together that package and it's the Macaulay Culkin package. I tell you. This. <laughs> yeah. It just made me laugh. Like they, people don't understand like you know, just when we're sitting there and just the different things that happen or I'll put my hand up and give you a backhand or it just makes me laugh. Oh, funny. Oh, you know, like what makes me laugh is that, um, like my sister, you know, she'll, her little girl, Bridie, my niece, is an absolute netball fanatic. She watches everything and they sit down and watch and Kath will go, oh, my God, I knew that you and Sue couldn't talk because you are pissing yourselves laughing at something <laughs> You're just going to be like, <laughs> I know. Is can't it... talk and I can't look at you. Yeah. <laughs> it's terrible. Anywho, so learning to shut up has been the main thing. Um, but also learning who you're commentating for, right? So, you know, I'll hear back from sometimes, you'll hear back through, oh, you know, this team didn't like how you were commentating. Like I heard last year, the Vixens didn't like one game with commentary what I said. You know what? That's tough. Because mm. my, I don't commentate for the players. I commentate the players. The fact that I get to sit up close and watch them play blows me away week in, week out, right? Because we, we see netball that we could never have dreamed of watching, right? Because they're fitter and stronger than any previous netball generation, right? So you see stuff happen on the court and you go, oh, my God, I was three metres away from that. Isn't that amazing, right? You turn into a fan. Uh, I, and I fan all the time because these women are just outstanding. But I'm not commentating for them. And you actually have to remember that you're probably not commentating for the people who are um, rusted on like netty heads because a lot of what we say, they know, right? We, they could actually watch the games with the commentary off and pick up a lot of what we know. There's little nuances that you'd only know with you, Gordy, having been a senior coach before with me, having been actually on the court. And you try and really bring those things. Mm. But I actually have had to go from you're commentating for the players because I was a player and you go, actually, I'm not. Okay, well, I'm commentating for the netball, really netball, um, the lovers at home. Actually, I'm not. The, our commentary really is for the wider audience who may not be familiar with netball. So you don't want to dumb it down too much because lots of people know the basics of the game. But you have to be able to draw people in and you have to talk up a player or point out what they could be doing better. And I, every time I open my mouth, which, as you know, is often, I always have the thought, if I don't say this, is it okay? Or if I do say this, is it going to add to that person's understanding of what's happening? And that is my filter through which everything gets pushed, right? Mm. And I think we've, our commentary has evolved. I, I don't know what you think. I'd like to know what you think. I think our commentary has evolved over the years to get to this point that we're now very clear who we are commentating for. And once you are clear who you're commentating for, then I think your commentary is that much better because you're really cleaner about what you're trying to explain. Mm. I think I definitely think since being with Channel Nine, that's there's been a real clarity um, in role mm. and clarity around, as you say, audience uh, and what our job is. You know what? Yeah, our job and I think is. totally. And you here we go. I'm cutting you off. It's just like commentary, isn't it? <laughs> I think. Um, <laughs> oh, I've missed you. <laughs> I think and one, of the, and one of the things that I think we probably should make clear when you talk about roles is that, you know, people on social media get on, they go, I don't like the blokes. Why do we have to have some random bloke? Ball by ball commentary is actually um, a really definite skill, right? You've got it. I've done it before. I would have to spend a lot of time to get good at it. Mm. Annie Sargent has done it. She's sort of, she's developed like the way she does it, but it took her a long time to get there. It would take me a long time to get there. Like the roles are really, you couldn't have me and Coxie doing a game, right? Because it would be, well, I would probably forget what we we're talking about the game and be start chatting. But, but like, you, I like, I don't, I think you need to have a role because I need someone who goes ball by ball. So I can then be really definite in what I'm trying to explain. Mm -hmm. And like, it's so, and I, when we got to Channel 9, you know, we had this big meeting and Keely <clears throat> got Ray Warren, who's a really well-respected, well-known rugby league caller, in to talk to us. And he, he's, he had watched some of um, our stuff from previous 
years. And he said, I don't know who's doing what. I don't know who's giving me, who's, who's describing what's happening and who's describing why it's happening. And that's the way Channel 9 do things. And I think that works really well. So that clarity, I mean, it must have made it easier for you with the, with the clarity of roles. Oh, and I, I, I think we've all discussed this, that the more time you spend in the chair alongside someone, the better you become. Or I always, I've always said, and I, and I have, you know, I love commentating with anyone, but you and I have always had that natural, I don't know what it is, we, our timings or whatever it is, it just seems to work for the best part. That's because we're funny. Yeah, I know. I know. I, and, I, and, and calling you Elizabeth, like, I don't <laughs> know where that came from, but it, it feels so comfortable, Elizabeth. Yeah, and the sooner it goes away, the better, because I only get Elizabeth when I'm in trouble. Yeah, so, there you go. But uh, you're right, right? So certain personalities work well together. And, you know, someone like Will McCoy, he's got a, he and I have a similar sense of humour, right? And someone was upset because they thought in the call that he was being rude to me. But I was like, no, nah, that's pretty much how we roll. I've, I mean, I've worked, I worked with him at Channel 10. I've worked with him, oh, God, for like a decade mm. on different things. You know, we've done motorsport together, for God's sake. Like, <laughs> now at least we're doing something that I know about. So you know like and different um organizations have their own way of doing things and i get that it's not everyone's cup of tea but i like that we're always trying to hone our craft and mm. be really clear about what our roles are and who we're commentating for and what we're trying to bring to the game and at the end of the day we are now commentating not just a sport but an entertainment product right so that means things have to change and you know we've spoken about this a lot before um, I'm not such a netball purist and I know there are people who are. So the changes tinkering around the edges of the game with things like bonus points, I quite like because it actually helps us tell a story in commentary. Right? We, and, but you don't need that to happen on a, in the Saturday netball context unless you know, people want it to happen. So uh, it's really exciting for me that we've been able to bring this great sport to millions of people who wouldn't have otherwise seen it. And, there's some tinkering around the edges. The commercial realities are that you've got to do that. Um, but so be it. I'd rather have a, a netball, a netball product that's tinkered with around the edges on air than have the pure thing off air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Now, listen. Uh, big question. Um, and I know you don't have a crystal ball, but how do you think we're looking for season 2020? I don't know. You know, I've, I would love to get a season in. Of course we'd love to get a season in. And I know it's been interesting seeing what's going on behind the scenes. There's been all sorts of things floated to try and get a season happening. I think, you know, I'm a real, a, I'm a politics junkie and a news junkie. So, you know, you know, you watch the COVID stuff pretty closely I sort of feel like we just have, it's something we have to roll with. You know, the fact that Australia has been so good in flattening the curve, there's a possibility that we might get something. I think the thing that has struck me is how pragmatic the netball players have been. Mm. You know, as Nat Medhurst has said, it's really bloody difficult to accept that when you're on a $30,000 minimum wage and you lose 70%. But I was so proud seeing how other sports have, have sort of really struggled to get to that that point of agreement that netballers just went, we get it. We're saving our sport. So as a result, I think that the players will be really agile. I think what gets lost often is how agile the players are and how much they just want to play, mm. do the right thing for the sport. And that's what they'll want to do. You know, then, then you get the overlay of all oh, what's best from high performance and what's best from recovery and what's best from the coaches and everyone else gets their overlay. But the underlying thing is the players, it's a pure thing. They just, <laughs> they just want to play. So I'm confident that we will get some form of season because the players will want some form of season and our sport is such that we can actually condense a 17-week season into three weeks if we have to. wouldn't be pretty, but you'd get there. So there will be some form of season, I think. Um, just what that looks like yet, I'll leave that to the experts to decide. Uh, how far away is your veggie garden? A uh, couple of minutes walk. Do you want to come with me? Yeah, so let's walk and talk and walk. Oh, sure, walk and talk. So, uh, oh, here we are. Oh, I'm a goalkeeper. I can't do two things at once. Well, you said it. Unless it's, I know, unless it's telling the goal defence what to do at the same time as I'm elbowing someone, but I try not to. So there's a couple of things I want to show you. Hang on, I'm just going to take the cover off my iPad so I can do this. Bear with me. 
Right, the first thing is something I never thought I'd have at my house. Oh, hang on, where do I? I can't turn myself around, Gordy. Oh, there How is do I do this? Oh, the, but we might oh there's a button. Well. Oh, you, you no, this is true. Here we go. Here's my netball court. Oh, so you're kidding me. No, nah, so um, where are you? Evelyn has taken up netball and we were getting a heap of landscaping done and there was some concrete left over and I said to Matthew, let's just pour a court. So oh. it's sort of 10 metres by 5 metres. So good. How often are you out there? Oh, quite often. <laughs> um, fetch, for fetching the ball. Glory. For your own personal glory. Oh, uh, no, do you know what? I really have to pull my head in. Like Evelyn will be like, let's play donkey, right? And I'll get to, like, I'll get her to... D O N K E, and then I'll have to be like, oh, I should let her win. Hey, did, did it she, really it hurts me. Did she get how good you were? Or did she? Nah, get- no idea. Nah, okay. Uh, she gets it a little bit, right? But the funny thing is, like, I coach her little her school team, her little under eights team that, you know, Ballina. And um, one of the mums was telling me, so she went to pick up her kid the very first week last year, and she picks up a kid and she goes, oh my God. Your coach is Liz Ellis. And the kid goes, no, mum. The coach is Evelyn's mum. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, love I deserve it. that. Yeah, love it. Totally. Oh, now I've worked out how to turn things around. So that's our little babbling brook there. Oh, no. And um, there we go. So that's a netball court. So that's a pretty good view of it. So if we head up, oh, God, hang on. This is a view from here. I don't normally show people this, but anywho, off we go. Uh, here's the chicken coop up here. The chooks are in there. How many have you still got? Oh, we've got five. We're up to about the third or fourth generation. Oh. You know? But we don't lose too many to um, predators or anything. So they're all in there happily sort of doing their do. Yep. Eyes are browns, good layers. Love now, here's it. my veggie patch, right? So um, my husband built it for me. It's in the shape of a mandala, which anyone who's into meditation will understand. It's a thing you walk around. So it's a little bit hippy trippy, but anywho. That's what happens when you live in the country. Oh, Liz, don't go there. <laughs> I know. I shouldn't have told you that. No. So here we are. So I've just actually I harvested all my asparagus this morning, but it sort of grows in amongst the mint. And there's my sage. Here's all my lettuce and parsley and there's rocket and here's all my bok choy. How good do they look? Very all my good. my Asian greens. And then I've just planted on the weekend. Oh, what have I got here? Beetroot. Because you can beat an egg, but you can't beat a root. That's a bit rude. Uh, <laughs> broccoli, lots of broccoli, a bit of red cabbage. Uh, That's oh, there's some caps- capsicums over there. If I come in here, so I've got my little divi here. I know it's pretty cool, isn't it? I love yeah. the fact that I have a vegetable garden now. Like this is, if you hadn't told me this was going to be my life 15 years ago, I would have laughed at you. Yeah. So there's some tomatoes and what have I got there? Oh, cauliflower because they're eight bucks a pop at the moment. So this is going to be worth hundreds. Um, <laughs> and so I've got some bananas. Um, I've got a curry tree out the back. That's the bomb. And let me show you this. Speaking of things, oh, that's my husband's shed. Hang on. Let's bring it back to me. I'm a bit more interesting than his shed and his truck. Yeah. Like if someone had told me this is my life, I would have laughed at you. But anywho, here I am on the farm. Walking barefoot. Don't tell Catherine, but we had a snake up here the other day. So yes, you've sent you posted so your brown snake that you had. Oh, it wasn't alone, unfortunately. So oh. look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Here we are. It's avocados. Oh Ooh. my! Wow. Aren't they good? Hey, you just hooked me line and sinker. Yep, so you need to come and visit, Gordy. There are so many avocados here. Anywho, that's about all for the moment. And there's my curry tree, which is sticking your curry. So there you go. There's oh. your little, on oh, this my house. Good job, Lizzie. I don't know that you've ever done that. That's a bit of an exclusive. <laughs> it is a bit of an exclusive, isn't it? I sort of try not to carry on about it too much, but I do like where I live. Yeah, it's quite uh, nice. People will very much appreciate insight and i'm not sure whether you're capable of walking and singing but before i let you go, <laughs> uh oh, to to the back end which most people tend to enjoy i believe uh which is called gordy's gas bags karaoke uh it started the episode one with shelly o'donnell and it's had its moments and it's had some of the average ones along the way 
let's face it, if you start with Shelley, who can sing, it's just downhill from there, isn't it? Are you, have you got a, a karaoke go-to song? Oh, nah. You know, I've said to you before, I don't dance, I don't sing. Oh, you don't? Um, oh, I mean, I do, I do sing. I sing with the kids all the time. And I've got to say, actually, I thought I couldn't sing. And then you have kids and you sing all the time. You go, well, I can almost sing. Um, I don't know. I should do some sort of old MacDonald had a farm. Oh, how about this one? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we just had a little bit of internet problems right in the middle of Lizzie's karaoke, but we're now sorted. I'm handing it over to you, Liz, to close out. <laughs> Liz Ellis, the most capped netballer in our history, karaoke. Liz Ellis lived on a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and on that farm there were, I don't know, shitloads of things, uh, <laughs> cows, E-I-E-I-O. With a mer here and a mer there, here a mer there a mer everywhere a moo moo. Mm, oh, Matthew Stocks lived on a farm, and he let me live with him too. There you go. Woo! Well done. <laughs> I'd much rather make up songs and sing them for anyone to hear. But you know, like my kids are into, like Austin's into, um, what do you call it? Cars. So, um, all this song that I hear all the time is, I'm American made bit like Chevrolet. So he sings this all the time. So all I get now is just songs from kids' movies. I don't even know that one. But anyhow, that's because I've got Oh, it's a Cheryl. Is it Cheryl Crow? I think it's Cheryl oh, Crow. Right. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Lizzie, so, we're heading into... So oh, it, yeah. it is the Anzac weekend this weekend. Uh, life will be a little bit different for all of us as we pay tribute, being a good blue, true blue Australian. How are you feeling? Oh, it's, I feel a bit disjointed actually this weekend. Like normally you'd be thinking about um, like the dawn service and um, and all that sort of stuff and then the football games around it. So it's a bit, I know, it's a bit sort of weird. I'm thinking that I might get up early and go and stand at the farm gate and just, you know, observe a minute silence and mm. that sort of stuff. So, um, but yeah, it's a bit sort of, it's a bit of a strange one, isn't it? We live in strange times. But I think the thing you've got to do at the moment is just make it up as you go along. Yeah, I agree. Well, I did tell, I've been telling everyone all this week as we send you off that there is a very big announcement next week and I've got a feeling you know what it is for Gordy's Gas. I reckon, yeah, I reckon you should get some dirty Kiwis on and start with Nolene Tarua. Nolene Tarua, that's right, folks. We're going to Kiwi <laughs> Week next week. We're leaving the Aussies. We've been doing it for three weeks. We're going to Kiwi land. We're going to spend a week in New Zealand and we are starting with the big dog, Nolene Tarua. But in the meantime, big round of applause for Lizzie Ellis. Thanks, Lizzie, for joining us on Gordy's Gas Bags and showing us through your beautiful home. Stay safe and stay funny, my friend. <laughs> Thanks, Gordy. It's hard to stay funny without you, but there's True. always technology for that, isn't it? Most important thing she said right at the end of this hour. <laughs> <laughs>